friends, Ashley from Ashley and Music Studio here today. And today we're gonna to talk about how the heck to get better at difficult rhythm transitions within a piece. And this video is gonna be a pretty specific video about transitioning within one piece of music to different note values. And this is something that I see time and time again is so challenging and rightfully so because it's a difficult thing to do. Before we dive in and before I start showing you the examples and giving you my tips, I just wanna share with you a little bit about my past struggles with rhythm because you might've noticed that on my channel, I talk about rhythm a lot. Rhythm and counting out loud and really understanding tempo markings and changing tempos and all of that is so, incredibly important and I say this as a person that used to really struggle with rhythm when I went to start my undergrad in college and I was a music major for piano performance my teacher was so appalled at my lack of rhythm she was very disappointed that I seemingly could not count out loud I had a really hard time changing between different note values within pieces and my pedaling was a mess and my pedaling wasn't a mess because of the pedal my pedaling was a mess because I couldn't count and coordinate my foot to come up and down on the correct beats she had me do so many things to work on my rhythm and she was an incredible teacher so she would have me practice for an hour a day for an entire semester with another student clapping and counting out loud these insanely difficult like cadenza like rhythm exercises where we would be switching from like 10 notes in a beat to seven notes in a beat to two notes in a beat and she was very intense about us getting them very precise and very accurate we had to be clapping at the exact same time so we both really had to be clapping and counting in time we did that for an entire semester there was one time where I couldn't play a list cadenza in time and she told me not to come back for another lesson until I could um, to fix my pedaling. I had to take remedial ballet. In ballet, obviously, you learn how to coordinate your feet really well. And so I had to take this ballet class with a bunch of five-year-olds as a college student in order to get in touch with my feet and to be able to coordinate and have a better sense of rhythm. All of those things helped so much. They improved my rhythm significantly. I can now say that I am a musician that has a very good understanding of rhythm, but in my heart, I remember all of the pain and all of the hours of practice and all of the exercises, all of the things that I had to struggle with to get to this point where I feel more confident with rhythm. It's incredibly important and a lot of people when they're learning how to play the piano don't realize how many little issues in their playing are connected back to rhythm. So that's why I talk about it a lot. Without further ado, we're gonna talk about some of those difficult transitions. So in order to get this concept across, we're gonna go through three different examples of rhythmic transitions within a piece. And I'm gonna tell you how to practice those pieces and what kind of techniques you can use to work on these specific transitions. However, when we're going over these specific transitions, just know that these concepts can be applied to any other kind of music that looks like these transitions. So the first example that we're gonna go over is a Mozart sonata, K545 in C major. And we're gonna talk about measure 41 into 42, where our right hand in measure 41 is doing 16th notes, and in measure 42, our left hand is doing eighth notes. And so even though the tempo isn't changing in this transition, it gives the feeling of a tempo change because we're coming from faster notes to longer valued notes, and that makes it feel like the tempo is changing. So that's the first one. The second one that we're gonna talk about is the Chopin E flat Nocturne, opus nine, number two. And we're gonna specifically talk about beat two of measure 23, and we have to switch to two groups of five notes. And then the last example I'm gonna take you through is Debussy's first arabesque. Measure 36 to 37, when we switch from triplets to pairs of eighth notes. All right, so for the Mozart example, we have four beats in each measure and we have groups of 16th notes changing to groups of eighth notes. And this is a really common trouble spot. And I see this spot cause a lot of trouble for a lot of different students. And whenever we're switching from 16th notes to eighth notes or from eighth notes to 16th notes, it can be really easy to rush or to go too slow because we're changing the note value. And so it gives the illusion of speeding up or slowing down, even though that's not really what's happening. Here at this point in the music, we're supposed to stay at pretty much an exactly even tempo. In order to do that, we need to break the beats down and know what the subdivisions are. So for starters, we're gonna count one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a in both of these measures. And as you could have probably guessed, we're gonna be doing a lot of counting. And whenever we're trying to learn the rhythm of a piece, if there are smaller note values, so if we have 16th notes or 32nd notes, we do wanna start by subdividing the beat or by dividing the beat into equal parts to make sure that our beats are consistent. And what I mean by that is if sometimes in the piece I'm counting one, two, 
two, three, four, and then sometimes in the piece I'm counting one and two and three and four and, and then maybe sometimes I'm counting one and a two and a three and a four and a. It's really easy to change the length of the beat without realizing it. So let me show you what I mean. If I'm going along and I'm going one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and a one, two, three, four. I'm totally changing the length of the beat in every single measure. And obviously that is not what we want to do. That's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to keep the beat exactly the same in each measure. If we're going to subdivide our counting, we need to subdivide everywhere to be consistent, at least in the very beginning. And then we will work towards taking those subdivisions away. So the first thing that I would recommend doing is to count these two measures out loud with the E and does and clap them with the metronome. So we're going to do that with these two measures and I'm going to tap right here. I'm going to tap what my right hand would play with my right hand and what my left hand would play with my left hand. And I'm going to start really, really slow with the metronome and then we will eventually increase the speed once we get the hang of it. So this is going to be 44 with the metronome. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. It's even hard for me to do it in this context. You saw in that first measure, I have the 16th notes and then switching to the eighth notes in the second measure. I'm going to do that a bunch of times until that starts to feel really, really, really comfortable. Now, once I've done it several times in a row and it feels comfortable, then I can experiment with starting to go a little bit faster. So then I might go up from 44 to say like 46 and then maybe 52 and then maybe 56. And we're going to repeat that exact same process at all of the different tempi until we get up to the original tempo, just with tapping and counting out loud. And I know that that might sound very tedious and it is gonna be a little bit of work, but it'll go by pretty quickly because once you start to work on speeding it up and once you're consistently able to do it many times in a row at a slow tempo, the process of speeding it up will get faster and faster. Then we're gonna do the exact same thing, but with actually playing. So we're gonna turn our metronome back down to 46 and we're gonna count the eandas out loud and we're gonna play through those two measures as many times as it takes to get it really comfortable and to get it really accurate. 3 E and a 4 E and a 1 E and a 2 E and a 3 E and a 4 E and a 1 E and a 2 E and a 3 E and a 4 E and a 1. And once that feels really comfortable and easy, then I start to very slowly speed that up until I get it back to the original tempo. We have all of our E and A's subdivided into these two measures. And eventually as we're speeding it up and as we're getting faster and faster, it's going to become more and more challenging to count it with the E and A's in there. And eventually we do want to get to the point where we don't need to be subdividing every single beat because it's exhausting. It takes a lot of energy to count one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a throughout an entire movement of a sonata. So as you start to speed up, you can experiment with maybe just counting the one and two and. And that might look like this. If I'm, let's say I'm up to, you know, 66 and I'm feeling really confident with my eandas. And so now I might play around with just doing the ands. Three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. Now, as I get faster and as I get more comfortable, I might get to the point where I don't even need to count the ands, where I can just count the big beats and that's the goal. Ultimately, we would wanna be able to play this whole sonata counting out loud, just saying the big beats. Let's see if we can do that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, I was able to do it just then, which is really great. And if you're able to do it, that's awesome. However, if you're not able to transition from the 16th notes to the eighth notes, I have two other suggestions. One would be to, to turn on the metronome when you're doing other things, like when you're doing the dishes or when you're doing other work that doesn't take up a lot of your brain power and to simply practice counting between the two. So counting one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one and two and three and four and, and just practice switching back and forth between the two. You can do this not even at the piano and that's going to help you get comfortable switching between those note values. If you can count out loud most of the piece with just the larger beats and it's this one transition or one transition, one of your pieces that you're struggling with, I would recommend starting to count the subdivisions just for these two measures, because this is where that awkward transition is. And you might have no trouble counting the rest of it out loud with just the larger beats. And so what that would look like is I would count my regular beats. And then when I got to this measure where I know I'm going to have the transition, I would start counting the subdivisions, but just for these two measures. So that that would look like this. One, two, three, four. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two and three, four. 
one, two, three, four. So you heard me counting just the big beats, and then I switched to the eandas when I got to the 16th notes to make sure that I could keep consistent when I switched to the eighth notes, and then I slowly phased out the eandas. And you can write this in your music, that's gonna make it a lot easier if you're counting the subdivisions just for some of the notes, but you're essentially using the subdivisions to cue yourself on how to make those transitions, and then you're getting rid of the subdivisions, because like I said earlier in the video, we don't wanna be counting with subdivisions forever. Ultimately, we wanna be able to feel that rhythm internally in order to get there a lot of the times we need to do the subdivision to bridge the gap between not being able to count and understand the rhythm and being able to understand the rhythm. All right, the Chopin example is quite complicated. And in general, a lot of the rhythms that Chopin uses in his music are really, really complicated. So the first step is always gonna be making sure that you know how to play the rhythms and making sure that you can count them. So you can see here in the measures that I've selected, the left hand is keeping us steady with one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly. And lollies are what I use to count triplets. Sometimes Sometimes people will count like one and a uh, or triple it, triple it, but I really like one lolly for two reasons. One, it gives us an actual sense of where we are in the measure because we're accounting these specific beats. So one lolly, two lolly. When we count triple it, triple it, triple it, yes, we're counting the triplet, but we don't know where we are in the measure. The other reason I like to count lolly is because it's unique and it's different than any of the other syllables that we use to count. And so it can be distinguished from one and two and or one and two and. And often, like in Chopin, we need to be doing triplets in one hand and eighth notes in the other hand or 16th notes in the other hand. And if we count one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly, we can actually count and line those up in a way that makes sense and in a way where we can actually count every single note value. So here you can see my left hand is holding down the one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly, and my right hand is doing some other complicated things. On the first third of beat two, I have two notes for that third of the beat. And then you can see that this is a group of 10. So that means for the second part of the triplet, I have a group of five in the right hand. And the third part of the triplet, I have a group of five in the right hand. Whenever we're switching to any kind of rhythm above four notes per group, it's usually pretty challenging because most people simply haven't done as much of that unless you're playing advanced repertoire all the time. Switching to a group of five or six or seven might feel really, really, really unnatural. And so one of the exercises that I'd like to start with is to just simply turn on the metronome and practice clapping different notes note values. So I can start by clapping quarter notes and then I can switch to eighth notes, which is two notes per beat and then triplets and then 16th notes. But then I can also switch to groups of five and groups of six and groups of seven and as many as I need to go. One, 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 two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, three, 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 four, 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 five, 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 six, 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 seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And with this exercise, you don't actually need to clap, just simply saying the numbers will help you switch between them. But you can see it gets harder and harder the more notes I try to squeeze in per beat. But doing this exercise over and over and over again is gonna be really helpful in learning how to switch to those groupings that we're not used to switching to. Now, once you can do it in order, then of course you go out of order. And so specifically with this example in the Chopin Nocturne, I would wanna practice going between twos and fives and twos and fives because that's what I need to do in this piece. So I can turn on the metronome and I can just practice those two groups. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And you always want to make sure when you're going to groups of five or six or seven that they are evenly taking up the whole beat. It's really easy to do something like one, two, three, four, five and to do the first part of the five fast and then the last few notes of the five slow, we wanna make sure that they're evenly taking up the beat. Now, once you can do that just with the metronome and the counting, then we can start to actually play. And then we can take that right hand very slowly and see if we can get that right hand in time by itself. And then we can add the left hand. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one.
Now you might have noticed that I was playing really, really, really slow. I was having the metronome click with every single triplet in the left hand, which is pretty slow for this piece, but I need to be able to do it slowly first before I can even think about speed. If I can play it slowly and correctly many times in a row, I won't even have to think about speeding it up because simply the act of doing it correctly or the same many times in a row, speed will be a byproduct of that. The first step with all of these complicated rhythms is to be able to do them very, 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 very slowly. And then once you can do them slowly and consistently correct, then you can start to speed them up little by little. Now this can be used in any Chopin piece. There's plenty of difficult rhythm things to do in Chopin or any Romantic era piece. So you can apply this concept to anything. You just need to know your groupings. You need to practice them with the metronome and then practice them very slowly in your piece. All right, now for the Debussy, we're switching from triplets to eighth notes. And this is one of the most common changes that messes people up. It happens a lot in music, but it's really, really awkward because oftentimes when people see a triplet, they think, oh my gosh, it has to go faster. And so we end up going triplet, 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 and the triplet fills part of the beat, and then we have an awkward space, and then the triplet fills part of a beat, and then we have an awkward space. So that's often what I see. Or on the reverse, people try to overcompensate for the fact that they rush triplets, and then the triplets are too slow. So it's difficult to get the nuance between two notes filling a beat and three, because yes, while the triplets are faster, it's just a little bit faster. So we can apply some of the same concepts that we applied before. So first of all, just turning on the metronome and switching between groups of twos and threes, twos and threes, twos and threes. One and two and three and four and one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly. And then once we can do that, we of course go to our actual piece and practice tapping and counting it out loud, just like we did with the other examples. And then we of course add notes to that. Now with triplets switching between eighth notes, this is one of the ones that you're definitely gonna wanna work away from subdividing. Because while we can initially count the lollies and the ands, eventually we wanna be able to internalize the feeling of a triplet and the feeling of two eighth notes. And we wanna be able to just say one, one, two, three, four. And we want our hands to be able to fill in the subdivisions between that. So going really, really slowly first, working our way up with the metronome. And you might need to do that several times. You know, that might not be like a one-off process. You might need to do that every day for a couple of weeks, but eventually you will get to the point where you start to feel it and it starts to become easy. And that's when you know you can start experimenting with taking away the subdivisions. But if you're ever taking away the subdivisions and you start to make a lot of mistakes or it starts to feel really challenging again, go back to what you were doing before and keep doing it that way a little bit more before you start to take away the subdivisions. Transitions in music. So passages that lead us from one section to another other section are often the most complicated and the most difficult to pull off. So I would really recommend that all of you go look at your pieces right now and wherever those spots are that every time you play you think, oh, that didn't quite go how I wanted to. Oh, well, and then you don't think about it until the next time you open that piece of music to play. I want you to look at those spots. Those are usually the transitions or the really awkward rhythmic spots and give those some extra attention. See if you first of all know how to count it out loud. If you can count it out loud, see if you can tap and count it out loud. If you can do that and you can take yourselves through all the steps of this video, chances are you're rhythmically strong in those areas and that's a really great place to be. Good luck with your practice. Let me know how it goes in the comments below. I would love to hear if you struggle with rhythm, if you've applied this and if it works for you and happy practicing. I'll see you next time.